hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Cause Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he was still white as snow. Now indeed I find Thy power in Thine alone Can change the leper spots And melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it all All to Him my own sin had left a crimson stain he washed in white and snow and when before the throne I stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin and left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raise this life up from the dead oh praise the one who paid my debt and raise this life up from the dead oh praise the one who paid my debt and raise this life up from the dead oh, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. You washed it white as snow. Lord, this morning we just thank you for, God, our ability to, to gather in this place, God, to be surrounded by our fellow believers, and God, to put our praises at the foot of your throne. God, this morning I just pray that your spirit would, would continue to fill this, this place as we, God, as we dive into your word, as we study your scriptures, as we continue to worship you. God, I pray that as uh, Pastor Rick brings your message this morning, that God, that you would give him the words to say. 
And God, you would give us the hearts and the minds to receive your message. God, we love you, and we thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, go ahead and turn to Psalm 137, and then I really, 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 really want you to pay attention to the title this morning. And what I've told you guys multiple times, I'm, uh, I am told I repeat myself often, and that is invariably during the course of a week, even though I plan these sermons a year in advance or more, uh, it's amazing to me, never ceases to amaze me, how God will send an illustration for the sermon for that week. Outrage. When your heart is filled with revenge. What about that Bama Vols game yesterday? Yeah, how many of you could hear Rocky Top playing all the way over here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you open your door or sitting out on your porch and you heard Rocky Top playing? Uh, and just for you transplants, and there's a lot of transplants in here. For you transplants, just to let you know, the last time that Tennessee beat Alabama was 36 years ago. First win in 36 years. And, uh, and again, the title this morning is Outrage When Your Heart is Filled with Revenge. Uh, what do you think Alabama is thinking about for their next game against the Vols? Yeah, uh, what do you think is going on? And, and you, you think about the obsession with Tennessee and Alabama all these years. For 36 years, you just keep hearing this game, it's this game, it's this game that uh, uh, folks are looking forward to, eventually the Vols will beat, um, will beat Alabama. Of course, they had to hire a guy from Central Florida. So I'm just reminding you. Just so you know, um, uh, for those who don't know, uh, Suzanne and I are from Florida. So, uh, so I think that, yeah, 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 yeah. And as a matter of fact, right in the UCF territory. Did you know that's the largest college in the United States? 66,000 students. UCF, yeah. So think about outrage this morning. And maybe one of the things you could think about is poor old Nick Saban in the middle of the game. And his, his special teams, one of his special teams, fumbles a play. A particular player fumbled the play. I would have played it up here. I would have uh, recreated Nick Saban yelling at that player. But unfortunately, uh, we, we couldn't because uh, he was rather graphic. In his, uh, in his chew out of that player. Uh, outrage, just plain outrage. Well, I want to take you back to Psalm 137. We've been looking at some of these psalms, and they're unusual. This is unusual, too, in that this song likely was never meant to be sung again in the temple. So, so already, before we have have arrived at this point that Psalm 137 is written and sung. In 722 B.C., the northern tribes have been vanquished. They've been uh, split apart. Uh, they've, they're gone. Now, it's the southern tribe of Judah and a few remnants. And, uh, and the Babylonians have come. And, and there's, keep in mind, there's no hard dates, but in 586 is the number uh, or is the year that most historians point to for the fall of Jerusalem. And then the captive people are hauled out of Jerusalem. The temple is destroyed. There's all the outrage as these foreign people come in and just do damage to Jerusalem, uh, destroy the temple, carry off everyone, and that includes the priests. And so the priests write this song of outrage. It's only nine verses. It's not very long at all, but it's filled with outrage. Now that's quite a bit different. It's quite a bit different sort of outrage than losing a football game. You know, this is your nation is destroyed. It's carried off. You're hurt. You're wounded. 
you're not just angry. This isn't, this isn't anger on the normal scale. This is outrage. So listen to these nine verses. Psalm 137, 1. Here they are. They're at the rivers of Babylon. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. And there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our harps. In other words, they had stopped singing. Verse 3, for there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. Can you imagine in days before, planes, trains, automobiles, they're just marching along. There might have been an animal or two to ride. And for all that distance from Jerusalem to Babylon, uh, these captive people likely sang, they sang the worship of God. They could no longer do it in the temple. They sang songs of probably praise, but also songs of sorrow. And then they finally get by the river, and they're tormentors. And notice the language that they use. There are captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked us for mirth. They're being taunted. They're being tortured, basically. Emotionally. This is a wrong on a different scale. This is, this is humiliation. This is somebody doing you wrong in a big way. And then verse 4. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Hence the reason the, the harps have been hung up on the willows. And doesn't that well describe, those four verses, doesn't it describe outrage when wronged? I mean, that's an open wound, isn't it? Have you been there? Have you, have you been wronged by someone else in a humiliating way? Can you identify? Hey, have, you, have you had someone else just make you feel like you're an inch tall and just hurt you and maybe and, and you feel that I mean you it's a wound it's as if there's a deep gash in you can you relate notice what the psalmist says next if I forget you O Jerusalem let my right hand wither I mean, do harm to my body. But in verse 6, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Now I have to tell you, as I'm, as I'm writing this sermon, as I'm reading this, studying this, I had to go, really? Really? I, I'm just, I'm amazed at these psalmists. I'm amazed at these Levites. Because for hundreds of years before this, through the minor prophets and the major prophets, for hundreds of years, they had been warned that this was coming. If they did not turn their way, if they didn't stop doing what they had been doing, they were, they were unjust to the people around them. They themselves were horrid to others. They had wronged other peoples and other nations. They had wronged one another. There was sin that was rampant in the camp. And, and God, through his prophets, had been warning them over and over and over again. And then the amazing thing is, 722 B.C. should have been a big lesson because the first one to get the warnings... In the midst of that was the northern tribes, was Israel. And they're carried off. Duh! You don't remember that? And here they are in their hypocrisy, saying, oh, we're going to remember you, Jerusalem. We're going to remember the good times. Oh, this is horrid. And I'm, really? Really? What about hundreds of years of warning? You know, I have to tell you, I do that in counseling a lot. I listen to people, and, and it's amazing how 
we can be warned over and over and over again that something is coming, and we just ignore it. We do, as human beings. And that's what they're doing now. Well, let's finish this off. It gets worse. Verse 7. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem's fall, how they said, tear it down, tear it down, down to its foundations, which is literally what happened in Jerusalem in 586 B.C. O daughter Babylon, you devastator, happy shall they be who pay you back what you have done to us. Happy shall they be when they take you who take your little ones and dash them against the rock. And by the way, that's one of the...
him I own. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. You washed it white as snow. Lord, this morning we just thank you for, God, our ability to, to gather in this place, God, to be surrounded by our fellow believers, and God, to put our praises at the foot of your throne. God, this morning I just pray that your spirit would, would continue to fill this, this place as we, God, as we dive into your word, as we study your scriptures, as we continue to worship you. God, I pray that as uh, Pastor Rick brings your message this morning, that God, that you would give him the words to say. God, you would give us the hearts and the minds to receive your message. God, we love you, and we thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, go ahead and turn to Psalm 137, and then I really really, really, really want you to pay attention to the title this morning. And what I've told you guys multiple times, I'm, uh, I am told I repeat myself often, and that is invariably during the course of a week, even though I plan these sermons a year in advance or more, uh, it's amazing to me, never ceases to amaze me, how God will send an illustration for the sermon for that week. Outrage, when your heart is filled with revenge. What about that Bama Vols game yesterday? Yeah, how many of you could hear Rocky Top playing all the way over here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you open your door or sitting out on your porch and you heard Rocky Top playing? Uh, and just for you transplants, and there's a lot of transplants in here, for you transplants, just to let you know, the last time that Tennessee beat Alabama was 36 years ago. First win in 36 years. And, uh, and again, the title this morning is Outrage When Your Heart is Filled with Revenge. Uh, what do you think Alabama is thinking about for their next game against the Vols? Yeah. Uh, what do you think is going on? And, and you, you think about the obsession with Tennessee and Alabama all these years. For 36 years, you just keep hearing this game, it's this game, it's this game that uh, uh, folks are looking forward to. Eventually, the Vols will beat, um, will beat Alabama. Of course, they had to hire a guy from Central Florida. So I'm just reminding you. Just so you know, um, uh, for those who don't know, uh, Suzanne and I are from Florida. so. Uh, so I think that, yeah, 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 yeah. And as a matter of fact, right in the UCF territory. Did you know that's the largest college in the United States? 66,000 students, UCF, yeah. So think about outrage this morning. And maybe one of the things you could think about is poor old Nick Saban in the middle of the game. And his, his special teams, one of his special teams, fumbles a play, a particular player fumbled the play. I would have played it up here. I would have uh, recreated Nick Saban yelling at that player. But unfortunately, uh, we, we couldn't because uh, he was rather graphic in his, uh, in his chew out of that player. Uh, outrage, just plain outrage. Well, I want to take you back to Psalm 137. We've been looking at some of these psalms, and they're unusual. This is unusual, too, in that this song likely was never meant to be sung again in the temple. So, so already, before we have, have arrived at this point that Psalm 137 is written and sung, in 722 B.C., the northern tribes have been vanquished. They've been uh, split apart. Uh, they've, they're gone. Now, it's the southern tribe of Judah, 
and a few remnants. And, uh, and the Babylonians have come. And, and there's, keep in mind, you, you, there's no hard dates, but in 586 is the number uh, or is the year that most historians point to for the fall of Jerusalem. And then the captive people are hauled out of Jerusalem. The temple is destroyed. There's all the outrage as these foreign people come in and just do damage to Jerusalem, uh, destroy the temple, carry off everyone, and that includes the priests. And so the priests write this song of outrage. It's only nine verses. It's not very long at all but it's filled with outrage. Now, that's quite a bit different. It's quite a bit different sort of outrage than losing a football game. You know, this is your nation is destroyed. It's carried off. You're hurt. You're wounded. You're not just angry. This isn't, this isn't anger on the normal scale. This is outrage. So listen to these nine verses. Psalm 137.1. Here they are. They're at the rivers of Babylon. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. And there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our harps. In other words, they had stopped singing. Verse 3. For there our captors asked us for songs. And our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Can you imagine in days before, planes, trains, automobiles, they're just marching along. There might have been an animal or two to ride. And for all that distance from Jerusalem to Babylon, uh, these captive people likely sang. They sang the worship of God. They could no longer do it in the temple. They sang songs of probably praise, but also songs of sorrow. And then they finally get by the river, and their tormentors. And notice the language that they use. There are captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked us for mirth. They're being taunted. They're being tortured, basically, emotionally. This is a wrong on a different scale. This is, this is humiliation. This is somebody doing you wrong in a big way. And then verse 4. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? Hence the reason the, the harps have been hung up on the willows. And doesn't that well describe, those four verses, doesn't it describe outrage when wronged? I mean, that's an open wound, isn't it? Have you been there? Have you, have you been wronged by someone else in a humiliating way? Can you identify? Hey, have, you, have you had someone else just make you feel like you're an inch tall and just hurt you? And, maybe, and, and you feel that. I mean, you... It's a wound. It's as if there's a deep gash in you. Can you relate? Notice what the psalmist says next. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. I mean, do harm to my body. But in verse 6, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Now I have to tell you, as I'm, as I'm writing this sermon, as I'm reading this, studying this, I had to go, really? Really? I, I'm just, I'm amazed at these psalmists. I'm amazed at these Levites. Because for hundreds of years before this, through the minor prophets and the major prophets, for hundreds of years, they had been warned that this was coming. If they did not turn their way, if they didn't stop doing what they had been doing, they were, they were unjust to the people around them. They themselves were horrid to others. They had wronged other peoples and other nations. They had wronged one another. 
There was sin that was rampant in the camp. And, and God, through his prophets, had been warning them over and over and over again. And then the amazing thing is, 722 B.C. should have been a big lesson because the first one to get the warnings in the midst of that was the northern tribes, was Israel. And they're carried off. Duh! You don't remember that? And here they are in their hypocrisy saying, oh, we're going to remember you, Jerusalem. We're going to remember the good times. Oh, this is horrid. And I'm, really? Really? What about hundreds of years of warnings? You know, I have to tell you, I do that in counseling a lot. I listen to people, and, and it's amazing how we can be warned over and over and over again that something is coming, and we just ignore it. We do, as human beings. And that's what they're doing now. Well, let's finish this off. It gets worse. Verse 7. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem's fall, how they said, tear it down, tear it down, down to its foundations, which is literally what happened in Jerusalem in 586 B.C. O daughter Babylon, you devastator. Happy shall they be who pay you back what you have done to us. Happy shall they be when they take, who take your little ones and dash them against the rock. And by the way, that's one of the things they witnessed as the Babylonians had done the same to them. But now again, I'm, I'm back to their history. And now you point the finger? But who are you really outraged by? I mean, really, who are you outraged by? This is a loss. Don't get me wrong. This is a huge loss. The loss of a nation. The loss of an identity. And, and now they're captive people in a foreign land. They, they don't get to choose what they want to do. Somebody else is choosing for them. And by the way, we feel the same sort of loss at times of divorce. We feel the same sort of loss when someone we know dies. We feel the same sort of loss when someone takes their own life. We feel the same sort of loss when someone else dies by accident. Those tragic sort of deaths. And one of the things that's common for all of those losses is a sense of anger and outrage. It just happens over and over and over again with us as human beings. And we get angry, and one of the first things we do is start to point fingers. We just point fingers at everybody else. But here's the tragedy of those sort of losses. We as human beings, when we suffer that sort of loss, we have troubles admitting who we get angry at. In the loss of those who die, we, strangely enough, get angry with them. We do. You know, they, they kind of check out on us, especially the, the suicides. They, they check out on us by choice. And there's anger towards that person. But probably the one that's most ironic, the one we struggle with the most, the, the anger that we just really don't want to admit because it's not the, you know, you're not supposed to do this. But we get angry at God. Have you been there? Have you been in one of those losses? Have you been in a divorce? Have you lost someone you love? Have you, I mean, have you gone through this sort of loss? And have you been angered and outraged? And then as you trace that anger, are you willing to admit that maybe even God is the source of some of your anger? You're angry at him because he didn't do something about it. He didn't change things. So here's these Levites, upset, I mean, just outraged. And they're singing this song, not because they want to, but because somebody else is making them do 
do it, and it's the person who's making them do it, or the people who are making them do it, are their tormentors, their captors. They're outraged. And so it's all coming out. So let's deal with outrage. Let's deal with anger, and let's look at some Bible passages that do deal with it. First, here's a couple of Proverbs, Old Testament and New Testament. It's about outrage. Proverbs 29, 22. That's a good one. There's plenty, by the way. One given to anger stirs up strife, and the hothead causes much transgression. So, do you identify with that? Have you seen that happen? That one who is angry just causes more and more strife? Or, what about what James has to say in chapter 1 of his letter, verses 19 and 20? Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. Let every person be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. Are you there? I mean, we do act badly in anger, don't we? And then when it's unbridled anger, when it's something like outrage, it gets worse. Because obviously we've been wronged. So what does this psalm, Psalm 137, teach us about us? Because that's the purpose this morning, isn't it? We're supposed to look at ourselves and grow better into Christ. So here's just four Four quick rules about what this psalm teaches us. There is no doubt, none at all, that wrongs wound us. I mean, we might as well admit it. We, all of us are walking around. We're, we're the walking wounded. There is somebody in our life either that has wronged us or continues to wrong us. And we just hold on to those, don't we? We just hold on to grudges. We hold on to those hurts. And, and we go around as these wounded people. And some people, some of us are just, we're good at peeling off the bandage and getting a fresh wound again. Number two, just like the psalmist in here, we tend to rewrite history by leaving out the important stuff. Do you do that in your own life? Yes. If you're willing to admit it, you do it. We tend to rewrite history, and it's always the story generally goes that the other person, the person who does wrong to us, is made to look a whole lot worse maybe than they really are. But we also have a really good tendency to make ourselves look as good as possible. There absolutely was no reason for him or her to do this to me because... Well, I'm like Mary Poppins, practically perfect in every way, right? We do that. We always think that if we've been hurt, if we've been wronged, it's always 100% the other person's problem. And just like the psalmist forgot the hundreds of years of history they had with God where he had been warning them, we tend to whitewash those. And then number three, in conflict, having run out of weapons, we fight dirty. We do. When somebody else trashes your tricycle, when they come over and they kick over your can of marbles, however this goes, when somebody hurts you and you get in conflict, we stop dealing with the issue. We start with the issue, by the way. And this is probably most prominent in things like marriages because we... We'll, so somebody squeezing the, the toothpaste from the middle of the tube. It's just annoying. Or why do you leave your underwear on the floor? Can't you pick it up? I mean, just all those little annoying things. And instead of dealing with the issue, once we run out of argument about the issue, we start to attack the person. Don't we? That's just like you. You are so much like your father. You are so much like your mother. You always do that to me. You, 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 you. And then
And those you statements are tough because that's the dirty part of the wounding. It was kind of like that southern tradition. You know, you know you're in trouble with somebody. When they come up and they smile broadly, they just wrap you in their arms and say something like, well, bless your little pea-picking heart. You know they don't mean bless you because there's a knife in their hand and they're stabbing you in the back. We fight dirty as human beings. But here's the big one. This is the thing to remember, and this is very true of the Jewish people. It's one of the reasons why long after, remember this is 586 B.C., long after they've been hauled off to captivity. By the time Jesus gets to them, they still haven't learned. And they treat one another badly. Because hurt people hurt people. They just do. Somebody who's wounded is carrying around a wound that somebody else put there. And when they wound you, you just happen to be the object of their hurt at that moment. Jesus understood this. He knew that he was in a world full of hurt people. And yet he demonstrated immense compassion throughout all of that, didn't he? And don't we? Can you identify with that? I heard some yeses and amens and I saw the nodding of heads. We do identify with that, that hurt people hurt people. But if that's a rule, if that's a given, can't we remember just with a measure of grace and mercy, every once in a while, people come along, and when they hurt us, it's actually because they're hurting inside. Something else is going on. But Jesus taught us a different path to handle outrage. Now, before I say this, I just for you expert Bible scholars, you're going to remember Jesus got angry too, not once, but twice. So I just want to remind you about the nature of that twice. And it's at the temple, and it's different. I mean, Jesus was just different when he, when he handled people who did someone else wrong. Now keep in, mind, keep in mind that the Levites, the Sadducees, the ones who were in control of the temple, had so, they had so torn apart worship of God that they were making money off of any worship practice at the temple. And they treated other people badly. The people that they should have had the most compassion for, you know, they, remember, there is one law that allows the poorest of the poor the ability to, to offer up two doves as a sacrifice, which they could have bought for a couple of cents. But these same, same Levites, these same... These same leaders, these priests, these con men, it changed the system to make money. And one of the ways they make money was they made them change their money, their street money, to shekel money. The only place in the world you could use the shekel was at the temple. And they did it at a premium. You paid big money for that Jewish shekel, that temple shekel. And then on top of that, they would have people who would take and grade the quality of your sacrifice. And if you brought your own doves, those people would almost routinely say of that dove, it's not good enough. Take it, sell you another at a premium again. And then the one you had turned in or the two you had turned in, they would turn around and sell to somebody else down the line. That's pretty evil, isn't it? Notice all the times that Jesus was attacked and humiliated, that he was demeaned, that, that people just ridiculed him. You never see him lose his, lose his temper, except for those two times, one at the beginning of his ministry, one at the end of his ministry. He loses his temper, and yes, Jesus got angry. But it was moral outrage about what someone was doing to someone else. So with that in mind, let's look at Friday. Now this is, to us, this is Thursday night. Matthew chapter 26, starting at verse 47, is Friday night though. And on the Jewish calendar, their way of reckoning things from sundown Friday until sundown 
Saturday was their Friday. So they've had the dinner. It's nighttime. Night has fallen. Jesus, by the way, on Monday had cleared the temple. That was the second of his two times where he had been outraged. And now, hurt upon hurt, humiliation upon humiliation, here comes a crowd coming to get him. And he knows this is happening. He's been, he's been warning his disciples about this for months. And one of them in particular is really doing him dirty. It's a friend. Matthew chapter 26, verse 47. While he was still speaking, Judas. And notice what Matthew does here. He points him out. One of the twelve. One of the inside circle. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived with him. It was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent by the chief priests and elders of the people. Those same people whose cart he had upset, whose tricycles Jesus had turned over on Monday. Well, they've sent a crowd after Jesus, and they've paid Judas 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus. This is a friend sticking his knife in the back of Jesus. And by the way, he was probably a little southern. Maybe he whispered in his ear, well, bless your little pea-picking heart. Can you imagine that humiliation, but look how far he takes it. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I kiss is the man, arrest him, and that's the kiss of friendship. But he turned it around. Immediately he went up to Jesus and said, greetings, Rabbi, and did what? Kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, and isn't that interesting, friend, he, he is the rabbi. For three and a half years, he has been rabbi to them, and they've been disciples. They've been students. But just a few hours earlier, just a little bit earlier, Jesus in the upper room had said to them, no longer am I your teacher. Now we are friends, and you may call me friend. So here's Jesus to his betrayer, reminding him in a subtle way, friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and took hold of Jesus and arrested him. But one of those with Jesus grabbed his sword, drew it out, and struck the high priest's slave, cutting off his ear. You know who that is. We get that from John. It's interesting. All four Gospels record this event. John alone is the one who names Peter. And I wonder if there's a little bit of friction there. Maybe. So here's Peter, slices off Malchus's ear. We also get that from the other Gospels, uh, the name of the servant, Malchus. Verse 52, then Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place, for all who take hold of the sword will die by the sword. You do realize that from this point forward, from the day of Pentecost forward, I should say, you don't see a record of them carrying a sword again. There's a lot of things they just don't do. They don't talk politics from that point forward. They talk Jesus. They don't carry swords. They go in peace. It's just amazing how much they are changed between this night and Pentecost Day. He said, put your sword back in its place, for all who take hold of the sword will die by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot call on my Father and that he would send me more than 12 legions of angels right now? Can you imagine that? And Jesus had the ability to do that. He could have just said, Dad, I need, I need 120,000 angels here right now to take care of this light work. And how do you think things would have changed if he had done that? Instead, he's there for a purpose that he and God, he and God the Father had come up with, and that is to reconcile us to himself. And so he points out the obvious in verse 54. How then would the scriptures that say it must happen this way be fulfilled? In other words, let it go. This is, this is supposed to happen. It's, it's set in course. And in verse 55, at that moment, Jesus said to the crowd, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me like you would an outlaw? Day by day, day after day, I sat teaching in the temple courts that you did not arrest me. But this has happened so that the scriptures of the prophets would be fulfilled. 
Then all the disciples left him and fled. And by the way, we also have from the other Gospels, guess what he does? And by the way, Peter was probably aiming for the center of the head of that slave. He just, for whatever reason, either rage or, you know how you are when you get really angry? Instead, he slices off the ear, and Jesus picks up that ear, and he plasters it on Malchus's head and heals Malchus. Wow, what a story, isn't it? Isn't that amazing? I mean, talk about showing a different path out of outrage. These people are here, and, and in the next few hours, he will be slapped and spit upon. He's going to have his back ripped to shreds. He's going to be humiliated, stripped naked. His possessions are going to be taken from him. He's, every humiliation you can think of is going to happen in the next few hours. And he knows it's going to happen. He just knows it's going to happen. Does that help you maybe understand for our Bible study bunch this morning? Does this whole scenario help you understand that Colossians 3, 13? Forgive as God in Christ Jesus forgave you. Forgive one another. Remember your grievances no more. Remember Jesus is, is showing us a different path to handling outrage. So this morning as we wrap this up, let's wrap it up with the Lord's Supper. So get out your communion and remember this last moment with Jesus. And ask this question. Outrage? Are you outraged by somebody? Are you dealing with anger with someone? Is, is there someone, and maybe it's years and years and years in the past, you have never forgiven them. You are just holding your grudge because the wrong they did to you was so bad. Are you there? Well, what about his? And when I say his, notice that his is capitalized. We're talking God here. What about God's anger towards us? And these two verses help us understand what's going on. What went on on that cross when Jesus hung on that cross and he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. Let's keep that in mind of 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. My little children, the kids, and by the way, when it comes to the handling things like this, outrage and anger and hurt and wrongs, forgiveness, we're little children. We don't know how to handle the emotions that we've been given. And Jesus has shown us a different way. My little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. Because we do sin in our anger. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Just remember that passage in Romans 8 where, G, where Paul is talking about our intercessors. We've got the Holy Spirit who carries, our, uh, who carries our prayers, but also is our intercessor, our advocate, our lawyer. And we have Jesus who stands at the right hand of God, bearing the marks of his sacrifice for us. And he also is advocating. He's our lawyer. He's our intercessor. He's the one who's speaking for us. But here's the real big verse. And I chose the New American Standard because it's one of the few English translations that has left this word as it should have been translated. Many of your English translations will say atoning sacrifice, but the real word, the big word, is propitiation. And here it is, verse 2. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Have you thought much about that propitiation and, and the struggles that your teachers and your preachers have in explaining it to you? Basically, this is what it means. By being the propitiation, He's making God propitious towards us. He's deflecting God's anger. He's turning God's anger. That anger that you deserve in your wrongs. Jesus has turned away. He's not just deflected them. He's taken the spear for them. That's why that moment on the cross when he says, my God, my God, 
why have you forsaken me, is so important for us to remember because it's that moment that he becomes the one who takes the anger for you. And I think that's a great moment to remember how we should handle outrage and wrong. Does that mean we just let people pass on stuff? No. I mean, some wrongs are just, they're wrong. But when that outrage consumes you, when it overwhelms you, when it becomes part of your persona and you know nothing but anger and you're known by others for your anger, are you known for your anger? Do people know you as a gentle spirit, a compassionate spirit as they knew Jesus? Or they do, do they know you for your anger and your resentments and your hurts? Are you a hurt person who hurts other people? Are you a healed person who brings healing to other people through the gospel of Christ? That's what we're at right now. So let's crack open this communion. Father, as we take and break this bread together, as we remember the sacrifice of your son, may we be humbled. May it mean more to us than ever before. Help us in our compassion and our mercy and our grace towards others. In Jesus' name, amen. And then, Father, as we take this cup, as we drink this blood covenant, as we remember the price that was paid for us, again, may within our hearts, our minds, towards our fellow man, learn mercy and grace. May we extend to them that which you extended to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's stand and be dismissed. Remember the signs over the door as we go into the mission field. And outside that door, it's not just sinners. It is hurting people who are hurting other people. We're filled with a world of people who do nothing but extend the hurts they bear to other people. And our job is quite different. We're to be light and love. We're to be the gospel of peace. We're to share with them about the one who can heal them. His name is Jesus, by the way. And if you don't know him, we are here to help you today. Just come and see us. Father, we give you thanks. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.